If you look at every championship team, much will be made about the coach or the superstars. But every single team on every single level of sport needs a leader in between the lines. When it comes to the defending champion warriors, there's no question who's the one providing that emotional spark behind the scenes. Mark Schwartz has more on the all-star who never turns it off. What does it mean to be the emotional leader of superstar teammates? For Draymond Green, it means delivering the right message no matter what time it is. I do it because this game is just bigger than what you see on the floor. You know, it's all the stuff that happens behind the scenes when no one's watching is when the games are won. It was 4 a.m. and Green couldn't sleep. The Warriors had just gotten blown out in Game 3 in New Orleans. Pelicans pounced early and dominated the defending champs. Green says he stayed up watching film all night. What rankled him most was how passively Kevin Durant played. Green needed to deliver a message. He challenged Durant to attack New Orleans at both ends to stop worrying about everyone else getting shots and to just do what he does best. Durant says he texted back three words. He kind of felt my vibe a little bit on how angry I was at myself. And you know, that's good when your teammates kind of know who you are through vibes and energy. So to have Draymond there meant a lot to me. Durant again dominating. Durant has been locked in all afternoon long. Message received. Durant scored 38. He hasn't looked back since. Clay Thompson recalls a recent text from Green that also hit all the right keys. Draymond just texted me and encouraging me, like, hey, Steph's come back. Uh, it's a huge load off your back, but we still want you to be as aggressive as you've been because that's when we're at our best. And just that simple statement he sent me gave me confidence. Every team requires internal leadership. You know, Draymond is the guy who happens to talk the loudest, and he has a lot of good things to say. So, yeah, he's been great leading the team from within. You can't lead everybody the same way. It's different styles of leadership that you must take on when dealing with different guys. And so that's kind of just something that I've learned over the course of my years. You can't lead a guy if you don't know him. Mark Schwartz reporting. Great to have Michael Wilbon back with us as we get you ready for Game 5 tonight from H-Town. So, Iguodala's hurting. Clay Thompson, not 100%. What must Draymond Green do tonight to help Kevin Durant and Steph Curry? Well, I don't think Draymond Green has to do anything differently than he did the last game, which was come within two assists of a triple-double. Uh, he's going to have to be terrific. Um, your star players need to be play fabulously on the road in playoff games. You're not looking for your role players to do that. But I don't know that Draymond Green can do that much more. Score more than 11 points, maybe. Uh, but with the rebounding and the assisting he's been doing and the defense he's been playing overwhelmingly, I don't know that it falls on Draymond. He and Steph Curry and Kevin Durant are going to have to play like the three, you know, all NBA performers they are. But it's some of those other guys like Sean Livingston. They're going to have to get minutes from those guys, if not necessarily big performances. And, and let's add to that the fatigue. That was a big topic after game four. So what adjustments must we see from Steve Kerr tonight on matchups and substitutions? Well, substitutions would be the big thing. I don't know that those guys can play as many minutes, the starters, as they did when they couldn't win at home. Draymond Green played 45 and a half minutes. They were all north of their average minutes um, in that game, and it didn't work out well. They were hangdog tired in the fourth quarter. Steve Kerr talked about exhaustion being a major factor. That generally only plays into the opposition's hand in a road game. So, I think, again, Nick Young, minutes. What can they get from him in sort of more than 10 or 12 minutes? How many minutes can they play Sean Livingston? Uh, Iguodala, who apparently gained time decision, what can they get out of him? And Clay Thompson is critical. Can they get a Clay Thompson-like performance north of 20 points despite his being a little bit hobbled? So there are a lot of questions for the champs tonight. All right, one final question. Quick prediction, who wins game five? Man. Uh, because of all the worrying I just did for Steve Kerr, uh, I'm going to say the I'm going to say I'm going to say the Rockets at home tonight. Defensively, they have just been aggressive and really up in those guys. That last possession in Golden State the other night, where Kevin Durant couldn't get to the rim, Clay Thompson couldn't turn the corner to his right and get to the rim for mm -hmm. a shot when they could have tied the game. 
I, I'm going to go with the Rockets at home tonight, and uh, especially being a little bit hobbled. For All the right. I, I expect Stephen A. Smith to be in your ear. Michael Wilbon with us live here on Sports Center. Exhausted? What do you do? That, that is the question surrounding LeBron James after Game 5 of the Eastern Conference Finals. We'll discuss the, the quandary the Cavaliers are in as they take elimination the tomorrow. The man can only do so much, I know. Right? Well, right now, Kevin Durant and Steph Curry in their own quandary after blowing a fourth-quarter double-digit lead in Game 4, and then they lost. Here's what's at stake tonight, Game 5 in Houston. The Rockets are the only team with two playoff wins against the Warriors featuring KD, meaning Golden State will actually have to play a Game 6 for the first time in the last two postseasons. Now, what worked in Game 4 for the Rockets? They ramped up the ISOs for James Harden and Chris Paul. According to Second Spectrum, the two stars combined to run 39 ISOs, the most between the two in any game this season. As for the defending champs, they need their two MVPs, their two-time MVP make that, for all four quarters. Steph has made seven threes in the third quarter of this series, shooting 58% in that frame. Rest of the entire game, he's made only six threes on 23% shooting. Steve Kerr, earlier today on the mindset. You can't just rely on your talent. When a team's getting into you and they're putting pressure on you and they're switching everything, you got to execute. It's the basics. It's the fundamentals. Getting open, you know, better passing, better ball movement. Um, but it all starts with uh, the force with which you play. I know I keep going back to that uh, uh, that comment, that that phrase, force. Um, but standing and waiting for a ball 30 feet from the hoop, which we were all doing, that's not playing with force. We know it's not going to be easy, but also they know now it's not going to be easy. easy. So. Uh, we're looking forward to it. I think we're excited, but the right type of fear and the right type of excitement. Stephen A. Smith joins us now as we get you ready for Game 5. And let's start, start this thing with the Warriors. Losing Andre Iguodala really hurt this squad in Game 4. We saw it, especially in that fourth quarter. If he's not able to go tonight, and if Klay Thompson isn't 100% tonight, which superstar, KD or Steph, must have a big game tonight to steal home court again? It's got to be Kevin Durant. That's the way I look at it. We all understand that Steph Curry galvanizes this team in a way that nobody else can, but that's primarily when he's at the Oracle. When you look at Kevin Durant, you're 6'11 with a 7'6 wingspan. You're a career 27-point-per-game scorer. You've got a pure J. You've got a handle. You've got a mid-range game. You can get to the basket. You literally have a height and or speed advantage against any single opponent that the Houston Rockets could put on the floor with you. And you are the one that is universally mentioned in the conversation as being one of the top three players in the world. Not Steph Curry. Handle your business. You are that dude. You're KD Trey Five, okay? This is who you are. And you're a champion in the NBA Finals MVP. The reigning NBA Finals MVP. Handle your business. All right, now, let's see how the Rockets handle their business because Mike D'Antoni said before game four that the pressure was on Golden State because a loss meant they would lose home court. Using that theory, who has the pressure tonight in your mind? Well, definitely Houston. I mean, you don't want to go back to Golden State down 3-2, giving them a second shot um, at closing you out at the Oracle. Not that they were, that was a closeout game. I'm just saying that as far as I'm concerned, the series would have been over had Golden State won game four at the Oracle. But there is slim to no chance that the Golden State Warriors are going to lose game four at the Oracle on their home court and then turn around in the very next game, they're going to lose on their home court again. That ain't going to happen. So if you're the Houston Rockets and you want to continue this series uh, ensuring a game seven, possibly having the material to take out Golden State in game six. You've got to win game five. As far as I'm concerned, if they don't win game five, the series is over. If Golden State loses game five, then we're going to have a game seven. It's just that simple. Quick prediction, Stephen A. Who wins tonight? Oh, Kevin, I don't... Oh, <laughs> I picked the Warriors to win in six games, so I got to stay with my pick. My man, Mike Wilbon, is just a few feet away from me, along with my brother, Chris Haynes. But uh, this is the bottom line. I don't jump off the ship like some people I know that I have to work with in the morning. That's all over the place, okay? I stay, I give you a prediction. I'm going to stick with it for the moment. This trepidation 
this hesitation. I'm, I'm a bit nervous about it. Well, ooh, I, I, I got to do my Austin Powers look here. I got to do my Austin Powers look. I'm going to stay with the Warriors with extreme trepidation. Wilbon's over there laughing at me with Chris Haynes, but ignore them. I would laugh at me too, though. I really, really would. But oh, I'm going to stick with the Warriors. I'm going to stick with the Warriors. Yeah, okay. And, and, I'm going to stick with the Warriors. Stephen A. Smith's coming back later this hour. Michael Wilbon, I'm sure, will be laughing much more. We'll ask them, does LeBron still have enough left in his tank to carry the Cavs to another NBA Finals. Sage. Okay, yeah, tonight the Crystal Game 5 in the West, 48 hours after the Rockets shocked the defending champs at home, and the Warriors are banged up. The loss of Iguodala uh, in Game 4 proved to be costly. Now Clay Thompson hurting as well. Head coach Steve Kerr addressed the status of both players at this morning's shoot-around. Listen. I believe Clay will play, but he, we're still listening as questionable. We've got to see how he uh, feels in pregame. And Andre, um, again, in incremental progress, and um, we'll, game we'll see game time decision. He needs more treatment, and he'll probably warm up tonight, and we'll see what happens. All right, that was a couple hours ago, and, and anything can change during a day like this, so important for the Golden State Warriors as we count down a tip-off here at Game 5. Let's check in with our Warriors reporter, Chris Haynes, who's probably still laughing at Stephen A. Smith, live from Toyota Center with the latest on Iggy's bruised left leg and Clay Thompson's strained left knee. Chris, what do you got? Well, first of all, I don't know how, how do I top that, just coming <laughs> after that brother, Stephen A. Smith. But what, what, I, what I have been told is that I was told Clay Thompson will indeed play tonight for game five. Um, there was concerns after that game that it would linger on, that that knee injury would linger on, that it would probably uh, get swollen even more so, but that has not happened. Clay Thompson did uh, participate fully in shoot around this morning. I was told he will play Iguodala as of right now, have been able to gather any more current informa information. He is still a game time decision thus far. Okay, so we will be counting down to tip off just under three hours. And uh, Chris Haynes, if anything comes up, I know you will let us know here on Sports Center. Thank you, Chris. Meantime, coming up next, Thank is you. there more clarity or confusion surrounding the NFL's new anthem policy? The latest reaction from around the league, plus new details on how the league's owners put this policy in place. Plus, for the first time in his career, LeBron James played all 82 games in the regular season. Now, deep in the playoffs again, is LeBron too tired to carry the catch? LeBron James, and you both think he looks a little tired. Not a little tired, he looks exhausted, and it's shocking. Do you think he looks tired at all today? He looks a little tired to me. I think everybody at this point is tired. It's up to us to see if we can, uh, you know, come back here for one more. Well, can you blame him for being tired? Nobody started more games this season than LeBron James. This despite playing in his 15th season at the age of 33. Two of the three next closest guys to LeBron are rookies. LeBron also led the league in minutes per game this season. And again, at the age of 33, way more miles in that body than the guys right behind him. Tim Leather joining us now. And I saw a headline, what can LeBron do to keep the season alive? How about what can the other Cavs do to keep the season alive? Because he seems to be doing everything. Well, in theory, that sounds great. And you'd love guys to pick it up. The problem is you have to look at the limitations of their personnel. So for me, it does fall on LeBron James. He might need two, four, two more 40-point games to get through this round, if that's what it takes. Because when you look at the rest of the guys on their team, for the most part, they are one-dimensional offensive players. Everything is predicated on LeBron James' ability to either score or create offense for them. I've said it all season. I don't think I've ever seen a team more dependent upon one player for everything that they do offensively. That's the pressure he's been carrying all year. Leading the league in minutes at 33 years old in his 15th year, probably not the best idea. What's strange to me about the way he looked the other night, Kevin, is he had 44 points mm -hmm. the game before. Mm -hmm. He looked fantastic. Yeah. Then he had a day off, and then most of the day of the game last night, you know, resting. He's not doing much on his legs. Why he looked that tired that early in the game, it was really surprising to me. The adrenaline will kick in. Hey, I'd love Kyle Corver to be able to go get his own shot off the dribble. I'd love J.R. Smith to start making shots more consistently or Larry Nance to get a jump shot. That's not going to happen. So yeah. it falls on his shoulders. He has to set the tone. He's the only guy they have that can dominate Boston physically. But you know, those guys you just mentioned, they play differently at home. So we'll see how they respond in game six on their home court. I think we're headed to seven. Feeling that crowd, yeah. right? Hey, the all-NBA selections, they've been announced for the season. We've got some history. LeBron selected the all-NBA first team for the 12th time, passing Kobe and Karl Malone for most such selections all time. You see the beard, Anthony Davis, Kevin Durant, Damian Lillard round out that first team what do you think of 
this selection in the vote? I got a problem with the absence of Steph Curry. I, I think he, you know, missing games hurt him. I guess, you know, he missed 30 games. I guess that's what was held against him. But to me, if that's what you're going to hold against him, then he shouldn't be eligible for any of the team. Well, he makes third team. If you look at his numbers and you look at the impact on that team and the way they played when he went out, it's clear this is one of Steph Curry's best years. And statistically, across the board, he had a better year than Damian Lillard. And I know Portland ended up a three seed. Golden State won 58 games. Mm -hmm. They were a two seed. So for me, Steph Curry has to be on one of those teams. Uh, on the first One team? of the first two. I have okay, no problem one. with kicking him up to the first team. Maybe you slide down Lillard to the second team. DeRozan slides down to third team. I know people are going to jump on that because they say, well, Toronto is the number one seed. Yeah, they won one more game than Golden State in a weaker conference. For me, Steph Curry should be higher than third team. I understand it's a very deep position to guard spot in the NBA. Guys have had historic seasons the last couple. But I think he got penalized for missing games. Yeah. And if that's the case, he shouldn't be on any of those teams. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the problem I have with it. Yeah, when you miss those games, of course, because of the knee injury and the ankle injury, it affects everybody. Tim Legler with us today. Coming up in the next half hour, continuing our countdown to Rockets Warriors Pivotal Game 5. Stephen A. Smith and Michael Wilbon live from Houston. Plus, with the Cavs on the brink of elimination, does LeBron James have enough left in the tank to get to his eighth straight NBA fight? So LeBron played hard. His numbers weren't the best, but he still outscored the rest of the Cavs' starting lineup. James had 26 points, while Kevin Love, Christian Johnson, George Hill, and J.R. Smith combined for 24. So, that's one of many reasons why it all comes down to tomorrow night as Cleveland faces elimination in Game 6 at home. Scoop Jackson takes a look at LeBron on the brink of elimination. Damn, damn, damn. And this isn't a Kendrick Lamar damn. This is the damn heard around the basketball universe indicating that the King's latest and arguably greatest run may be coming to an end. The young, energetic Boston Celtics have the 3-2 series lead. One loss away. Damn. From the day this season began, LeBron James seemed to be on a quest to prove some things. Prove that he can handle the whole way to playing a full 82 game season. Prove that he can take over entire playoff series practically by himself. Prove that he had a clutch gene that was just as lethal and legendary as anyone that's ever played this game. To the winner, oh! LeBron James delivers! Prove how every time he stepped on the court, this season and during these playoffs, generational greatness is reserved only for the chosen few. And that he will always be, as the tat on his back verifies, the chosen one. The greatest individual season of LeBron James's GOAT built career is sitting on the verge of an ending. Damn shame he may not have enough help to overcome this 2-3 hole. But if this happens to be it, one thing is known. LeBron is going to make damn sure his exit this time would not be without a final reminder of who is king. Sports Center on the road. Our coverage from the Western Conference Finals continues with Stephen A. Smith and Michael Wilbon joining us courtside in Houston. But guys, let's talk about the East again. You heard the piece from Scoop Jackson. LeBron last night saying exhaustion, not a factor. You watched the game. Ty Lue even said he looked tired. Stephen A., the man has not missed a single game this season. Uh, if he is exhausted, we understand. What does it mean going into tomorrow night, elimination game? Well, he's tired. There's no question about it. He was definitely fatigued yesterday. Uh, he can't skate around that. He was lying when he said that it wasn't a factor. It clearly was a factor. <laughs> he was turning the ball over his shot selection. He wasn't hustling back on defense. All things are true, but he is the best player in the world. And more often than not, he's got a load of responsibility on his shoulders, particularly considering how his starting backcourt has played Mike Wilbon. J.R. Smith, one for six, two points in 26 minutes. I'm trying to be nice. I won't get started. But in the end, what it comes down to is that he's going back home to the queue. And a lot of expectations are there that it could potentially be his last home game, his last game in the Cleveland Cavaliers uniform on their home court. I think because of that reality, you will see LeBron show up and show out 
in game six. At least that's the way I'm looking at it, Mike. You know, players are fond of saying, particularly great players, they love to say, oh, I'd rather be on the road away from the distractions. That may be fine until about 7.30 p.m. or whatever tip-off is, but there's a reason that you play all season and try to have home court advantage. There's an energy that in 99.9% .9 of the cases, if not 100%, you derive from your home crowd. And so LeBron, I expect him to not get tired or not as tired tomorrow night as he would on the road in Boston. That pertains to anybody, even LeBron James. We're fond of saying he's superhuman. No, he's not. He's just closer to that than probably anybody else. But, yeah, he was tired last night. He sort of kind of acknowledged it. Ty Lue did acknowledge it, and you don't have to acknowledge it. You can see with your own two eyes. You don't need any analytics to see that LeBron James was tired. He talked about the three turnovers that he wished he had back. Those were probably a result of fatigue, when you're, when you're breathing harder than Mike Wilbon and myself, that means you're tired. <laughs> yeah, Just exactly. That Just says something. But, but real quick, guys, again, because of how he seems in that game last night, down 3-2, eliminate. I know it's at home at the queue. What are you expecting to see, though? I expect LeBron James to go ballistic. I think he'll have another triple-double with a 40-plus point effort. The problem is, even though I expect him to win, we can't definitively predict it because his supporting cast may not show up. Instead of being basketball players, they may resemble a bunch of construction workers shooting nothing but bricks, can't hit the backside of Broadway. And that's the problem that you have to concern yourself with, Mike, because if Cleveland shows up tomorrow night and the only person that shows up offensively is LeBron James, they're going to go home in six instead of seven. Yeah, th th those guys have to play. They play at home. They got to play better at home. That's what we've seen in these playoffs a lot is the role players, the support players playing better at home. Kyle Korver's got to be out there more than 18 or 19 minutes tomorrow. I expect to see a much bigger contribution from him. And all of the people that Stephen A. just mentioned in support of LeBron, I, I, I cannot see LeBron James losing Neither tomorrow can. night, particularly the way this series has gone with the home team being so dominant and particularly – under these circumstances with LeBron James. Look, everybody will say, oh, we're not concerned about this being the last game of LeBron's tenure or the last game of the season. They'll say all that, but it's in the back of their minds. And, of and the later you go in a game, it could be in the front of their minds. So I think we both expect a great game mind, out of the Cavaliers and a win out of the Cavaliers. Tomorrow night, game seven's an entirely different animal. Front of their mind by the end of the game, yes. And you know what? You know it's in the back of LeBron's mind. It's in there somewhere. We all know that. We're going to have to wait a couple more months to see what happens there. Guys, thank you. Enjoy tonight's game there in Houston. In the media, you showed us, Tim, how the Rockets basically ignored Kevon Looney. And, and you get it. On the offensive end, the young kid, first playoff start, got in some foul trouble, played okay defense, but you understand why they ignore him. No Iguodala. Let's assume yeah. that he's not going to play tonight. What happens? What are they missing without him? I think they might need to look at getting another offensive threat on the floor if the game is tight in the fourth quarter because Looney, he's had an impact on this team. He's been better for them in the postseason than I ever thought he would be mm -hmm. because of his defensive presence. But offensively, the other night, Eric Gordon basically ignored him. He played a one-man zone wherever Looney went. Eric Gordon disregarded him, and he stayed there outside the lane, and he waited for Steph Curry and Kevin Durant, and he made them look at traffic. He made them look at bodies and driving lanes, and it made them reluctant to try to get to the rim. He even jumped out one time when they brought Clay Thompson off a double screen. He just jumped out into the passing lane as a third defender with Looney under the rim. He just let him go. Looney's not a threat. The ball's not going to end up in his hands like a magnet. Andre Iguodala, when he's on the floor, that ball comes in his hands. I know he's not a great shooter. Capable of making the three here and there, but his big thing is he will then go attack, make a play, and find somebody. So not having that, maybe you go to Sean Livingston. Maybe David West gets a call tonight who did not play in the last yeah, good game. Point. They're worried about him defensively, but offensively, if the game is tight, you need another guy that's a threat on the floor to take some of the pressure off of your big scores that are not playing with extra people in their face. Amazing how one game makes a difference, and there's a lot of concern now with the defending champions. Tim Legler.